Judge Andrew Napolitano of Fox News has long argued a hardcore libertarian position on the nation's largest cable news network, consistently holding George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and now his friend Donald Trump accountable for alleged abuses of power. In the judge's analysis, the Mueller report on Russian interference in the 2016 election lays out multiple instances in which President Trump attempted to interfere with the investigation, thus making him guilty under federal laws governing the obstruction of justice. If he had ordered his aides to violate federal law, to save a human life, or to preserve human freedom, he would at least have a moral defense to his behavior. But ordering them to break federal law to save him from the consequences of his own behavior, that is immoral, that is criminal, that is defenseless, and that is condemnable. The president responded with a series of hostile tweets, claiming that, among other things, Napolitano had asked to be named to the Supreme Court and had requested a pardon for a mutual friend. Napolitano sat down with reason to defend his name, lay out his case against the president, and put Donald Trump's presidency in a historical and constitutional context. Judge, welcome. Thank you. The thing that got this started was your reaction to the Mueller report. You said that uh, the, president, the president claimed that the report completely exonerated him in his campaign, showing no collusion and no obstruction of justice. You disagree. Uh, where is the president wrong? First, I reject the word collusion. That mm -hmm. word was insinuated into our vocabulary very shrewdly, I might say, by Rudy Giuliani, so that he could say, the president's not guilty of collusion. And by the way, collusion is not a crime. Well, mm -hmm. that, that's a circular argument. The, the crime is conspiracy, an agreement to accept something of value from a foreign national, which is unlawful in a federally monitored campaign. Uh, I, I didn't see the underlying mm -hmm. evidence, but 127 communications between the Trump campaign or the Trump organization and Russian intelligence in a 16-month uh, era would be enough to prick my curiosity and mm -hmm. to want to look a little deeper. But that's not what I'm challenging him on. I'm challenging him on whether or not um, there was enough basis to prosecute him for obstruction of justice, and there clearly was. Mm -hmm. The reason, in my view, Bob Mueller did not ask for permission to seek an indictment, and under the Bill Barr uh, managerial ship of the DOJ, he had to ask the Attorney General for permission to seek the indictment, as Barr has this bizarre, narrow view of the obstruction statutes uh, which would have caused Barr to say, no, I'm not going to let you go to a grand jury with this. In Attorney General Barr's view, it is impossible to commit obstruction unless you actually committed the crime being violated and you're trying to mm -hmm. obstruct efforts to uh, investigate the crime that you committed. So Barr is saying because there was no conspiracy, there, there couldn't be any obstruction correct. trying now, to make if, sure that you don't this get guilty so, then Richard Nixon couldn't be charged with obstruction of justice unless he was actually one of the Watergate burglars right. under Barr's theory. That's how absurd it is. We also know that it's been rejected uniformly. Uh, Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick of Detroit was convicted of obstruction of justice for interfering with an investigation into his extramarital affair, mm -hmm. not a crime. Uh, Martha Stewart was convicted famously of obstruction of justice for interfering with a prosecution of her for insider trading, even though the insider trading charges against her uh, had been uh, dismissed. And very tellingly, at the very moment that Bill Barr was making his you must be guilty of the insider crime nonsensical Jesuitical sophistry arguments, <laughs> his own Department of Justice was announcing an indictment of a Massachusetts Superior Court judge for obstruction of justice. Her crime, she has before her an illegal immigrant who's there on a disorderly person's charge. He was drunk and disorderly. It was a nonsense charge. In the back of the courtroom are ICE officers. This is the government's version, not hers. She says to the ICE officers, we're going to release him into the lobby of the courtroom, courthouse. Her sheriff's officers released him to the parking lot and he escaped. Hmm. She was indicted for obstruction of justice. The underlying crime, re-entry into the United States after deportation, one she couldn't mm. possibly have committed. So by Barr uh, accepting this narrow view, and I only know two people that hold this view, the Attorney General and uh, former Harvard Law professor Alan Dershowitz, mm. um, Bob Mueller knew that uh, 
that it didn't even pay to recommend pursuing him, pursuing the president on obstruction. What, was what a, is, what's an example of him actually trying to obstruct? I mean, oh, it's clear are, that like many okay. of his minions okay, so, didn't do his bidding, but correct. he was so, trying to. Obstruction is defined as impeding or attempting to impede for a corrupt purpose mm -hmm. with an investigation or a judicial proceeding. A corrupt purpose is defined as one that benefits the obstructor. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, he said to KT McFarlane, my former Fox News mm -hmm. colleague, oh, there's this problem with the ambassador and Flynn, you know, just put a letter in the file and claim that this is what the, what the conversation mm -hmm. was about. Knowing the file was about to be subpoenaed, that's an effort to okay. impede. He says to uh, Don McGinn, you said what to the mm -hmm. FBI? Go back and tell them you were wrong. You want me to mm -hmm. lie? Go back and tell them you're wrong. Mm -hmm. That's an effort uh, to impede. Uh, so there are numerous examples. Yep. Depending on how you read them, there's either 10 or 12 of those uh, examples in the uh, Mueller report. Mm -hmm. There's one that's a little interesting there. It tells you something about the president's character. Uh, we now know why he was so determined for General Flynn not to be prosecuted. I mean, General Flynn was lying, a prosecutor for lying to the FBI about a conversation that may have been mm -hmm. lawful or may not have been lawful, a conversation with the Russian ambassador Kislyak about sanctions. Why did he have that conversation? General Flynn in his plea negotiations told Mueller the president told him to have the conversation. If the president had revealed that, I don't think that Mike Flynn would have been hmm. prosecuted, but that revelation never came. Hmm. What the president wanted to hide is that he is the originator of the conversation. Right. Why does he fear it? Because it happened before he was president. And so if the incoming, but not yet there, administration says to Russia, don't worry about sanctions. We're going to take care mm -hmm. of you once we're in office. That violates a federal statute which prohibits interfering right. with the country's foreign policy. As a matter of law, is it settled whether or not a, a sitting president can be indicted on criminal charges? That is a very good question. The Justice Department, you probably don't know this because it's mm -hmm. never been explained properly on, uh, on, <laughs> in the media, has three opinions. One says no, the other says no, the third says yes. Mm -hmm. But they all say if the statute of limitations is about to run, the president can be indicted, the indictment can be sealed, and he won't be prosecuted until he's out of mm. office. All three of them agree on that. Mm. So do you think that's likely to happen? No, but it should have. Mm. It won't happen while Bill Barr is the attorney general because of this view that he has, this supposedly mm. academic view, but there's no support for it, of you must be guilty of the underlying crime. Is Barr a particularly bad attorney general? Oh, Nick. I mean, the Bill Barr that I know when he was the head of the Office of Legal Counsel in the early years of the George H.W. Bush administration, so that's the think tank within the DOJ that tells the rest of the DOJ what the law means, and from there he became the Attorney General, wrote the original memo to the President about the constitutionality and virtues of mass warrantless surveillance. Mm -hmm. So right there, it's very difficult for me to, to find good about him. Mm. It would be an unbelievable good. It would be angels coming down from heaven type good to outweigh an evil that pernicious and mm -hmm. pervasive. Because from that single memo, developed the 60,000 domestic spies we have now that work for the NSA. So let's talk about Donald Trump in the context, not, not about his personality per se, but as a president, he's coming on the heels of George W. Bush, Barack Obama, two presidents you lambasted for massive uh, kind of violations of constitutional strictures on power. When you think about Trump from a constitutional point of view or from executive power, is he the same as these guys? Is he worse or is he better? Well, he's certainly not better. He's mm -hmm. either the same or worse. I mean, Barack, well, you, you tell me which is bad, which is worse. Mm -hmm. Barack Obama using drones to kill people, no due process and right. no declaration of war, but reporting the killings. Donald Trump using drones to kill people and not reporting the killings. Right. I don't know which but is worse. But then at various points, he's like, we got to get out of stupid wars. And he uh, doesn't yeah. get us out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you think that what's happening in Caracas is happening without the CIA's involvement? Mm. I mean, if they topple Maduro, who's going to pay for uh, shoring up their economy? Right. But your great-grandchildren, because the government doesn't have the money, yeah. they have to borrow it. 
So uh, uh, what um, do you see in the Democratic nomination, uh, the people running for the Democratic presidential nomination, uh, is there anybody there who is good from a, a kind of presidential power constitutional perspective? Or is this, is it just you know darkness all the way down? I think it's darkness uh, all the way down. Again, it depends on mm -hmm. what you mean that's good. Uh, when I talk to Democrats on air mm -hmm. and off, and I say, what is the overriding issue? They all say one thing. It's not Medicare for all. It's not redistribution of wealth. It's not war and peace. It's not marijuana. It's not civil liberties. It's defeating Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. they, they wouldn't care who defeats Donald Trump or what the person's ideology mm -hmm. is as long as it's anybody but Trump. That's their attitude. There's, there's not a libertarian drop of blood not one drop yeah. in all their bodies. So how, what do we well, do? To, take that back. Yeah. Bernie Sanders has some libertarian inclinations mm -hmm. when it comes to spying and civil liberties. Mm -hmm. What about Joe Biden, who is currently, you know, riding? Uh, not only is he, you know, riding the top of the polls among Democrats, but you know, he's he would if the election was held tomorrow, he would beat Donald Trump. Yeah. How bad is he in terms of kind of civil liberties and constitutional limits on power? Well, Barack Obama ran as a civil libertarian, which, as you know, and this is very divisive amongst our friends, enticed some people uh, to vote for him. And his record as a United States senator from Illinois was fairly commendable when it came to civil liberties. He became the president and he did a 180 degree flip. I, I don't know where Biden would be on these things. I think the government would be a lot more bipartisan and civil hmm. if he were president. But in terms of civil Liberties, I, I don't think he'd be any better than the president under whom he served. There must be some horrific temptation once you're inside 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. I think Grover Cleveland was the last president who ever vetoed legislation because it was unconstitutional. Um, did you ask to be nominated to the Supreme Court? I did not. Um, but I was asked by him to discuss the court for about three hours in two 90-minute uh, conversations, both alone and with others. And you said you gave a spiel. What is, what's the elevator pitch of like, not that you want to be on the Supreme Court, but what would you bring to the Supreme Court? That's well, I, I described to him, I was describing Neil Gorsuch and he mm -hmm. thought I was describing myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I described a, a courageous libertarian revolutionary who would uh, undermine the administrative state or at least seek mm -hmm. to do so, only one of nine uh, votes who would um, you know, undermine, and I ticked off a couple of particular Supreme mm -hmm. Court opinions that vastly expanded uh, uh, federal power, and he found those arguments uh, appealing. Do you feel the court is moving in the right direction in terms of uh, you know, kind of what Steve Bannon called deconstructing the administrative state? Or? Well, on deconstructing the administrative state, yes. Mm -hmm. On the primacy of the individual over the state, absolutely not. Hmm. What, what do you mean by that? What, what's well, the, my, the, the conservative wing of the Supreme Court is, is not into uh, individual or civil liberties. Hmm. Uh, the Fourth Amendment is going to be shoved in a drawer in a couple of years. What, uh, we have politicians who don't care about individual rights. Right. Uh, we have justices who don't care about individual rights. What, right. where, does, where does change come from in this scenario? Well, we have a president that doesn't can, can care for individual rights. We haven't had a president mm -hmm. who cares about individual rights in our lifetime. I don't know uh, where where the impetus will come from. Mm -hmm. uh, even the so-called libertarians in the Senate, you know, here, I'm going to take out my iPhone. So what's mm -hmm. in here? Personal, uh, professional, medical, financial, intimate. Mm -hmm. In Brett Kavanaugh's world, the government does not need a search warrant to get in here. They could just get in here electronically. Did you hear that discussed at his confirmation mm -hmm. hearings? Absolutely not. Did anybody bring that up? Liberal Democrat or conservative or libertarian Republicans? No. Mm -hmm. They were more interested in how many ice cubes he spat out at some woman at Yale uh, 30 years ago. Because both parties are in favor of big government and the, uh, and the surveillance state. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that's going to be cracked short of a bloodless revolution. Where does that revolution, is it, is it in our hearts? Uh, I mean, this is, I well, guess, the question. all revolutions yeah. start in the heart, Sam Adams, <laughs> <laughs> Tom Jefferson. Um, I, I don't know if, you know, 
parts of the country will just start to ignore Washington. Washington will be so bankrupt it can't pay its bills. No one will lend it money. I mean, Trump's borrowing a trillion dollars a year, and uh, even the Republicans in the Senate are probably going to let him borrow another trillion. Um, he had some agreement just the other day with Mrs. Pelosi and Senator Schumer. Two trillion dollars. We're going to repave Route 80 from the George Washington Bridge to the uh, Oakland Bay Bridge. Where's the two trillion going to come from? You're already borrowing a trillion a year. But they don't care about the, the potentially catastrophic consequences of debt, which will be ignoring the government. Hmm. So it might work out. It might. Okay. Well, we're going to leave it there. Thank right. you so much for we're talking. Ending, ending on a happy Judge note. Judge Napolitano. Yeah, finally. Finally. <laughs> Thanks so much. Pleasure.